Hey, Reese again. Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Communication Breakdown. This week, I'm talking with Martin Turner, one of the founding members of the British prog rock band Wishbone Ash. Martin wrote lyrics and played bass guitar on such albums as Pilgrimage, Wishbone 4 and Argus, and was instrumental in creating the signature Wishbone Ash sound. Since 2005, Martin and his new band, now named Martin Turner x Wishbone Ash, have been playing the hits of Wishbone Ash all across the world. Martin and his band join me over Zoom to talk through 50 years of history. Enjoy. On this call, can you see your own face in the in the iPhone? Well, up up in the corner there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you just try and make sure that you we get like your whole head? Oh yeah. I've I've been looking like a kind of mushroom-headed hippie, right? Because I haven't had my hair cut uh, all year. And my hair really grows heavily, so I look a bit like a I look like a bit like a sheep that's been sheared. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I, it's a good peace of mind that everyone's sort of in the same situation, really. Yeah. yeah. Everyone's uh, got messy hair at the minute, I think. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Yeah. So you started playing guitar at the age of fourteen, but then um, switched to bass. What What was the Why did you make the switch to bass? I was everything. I did everything with my brother, and we both played guitar. And basically, we got offered a gig at a place in Paynton near where Hobbit lives called Foxhall Youth Club. And we said, Yeah, we can do it. So, once we'd agreed to do it, we realized that one of us needed to switch to bass. Right. We tossed a coin to decide who would play bass and I lost the toss so that's how I became a bass player <laughs> but I'm not a bass player really I'm a guitar player but I always play bass when we're on stage so did you have um, a sort of musical family or was there much music in your upbringing I did yeah both my grandmothers uh, played piano my father played music virtually non-stop he had invested in a big old radiogram. Do you remember? Have you ever seen a radiogram at all? I don't think I have, no. Right, it's a big piece of kind of furniture with a massive speaker in it that goes in the corner of the room. Right. And it plays records. Um, when we wore a lot of them out, uh, my brother and I used to take them to the end of the garden and stuff them in the soil so they were sticking up. And then we used to go back to the house and fire at them with our pellet guns, you know, two two big BB guns, right. and smash them to bits. And the pieces we used to use as plectrums to play the guitar. Wow. Yeah. That's quite interesting. Sort of a very early recycling. Creative, yeah. So yeah, so um, so at nineteen sixty nine, uh, you're twenty one, twenty two years old. Yeah. Um, you and Steve decide that um you're going to sort of form sort of the skeleton of, of what would become Wishbone Ash. Um, how did how did you and Steve know each other? Steve played in one of the other bands called the D-Box, and we liked it. We liked the cut of his jib. He was an unusual drummer, a bit jazzy, yeah, really good. We liked him. And we decided that um, we needed to get him in our band. But it took many, many years before that actually happened. But we did persuade him one night in a well-known establishment in Exeter called Dirty Dots Cafe, which um, this woman used to keep this place open until two o'clock in the morning to feed starving musicians on the weekends. Right. Uh, we, we were, the Empty Vessels, which was our band, we were a three-piece band, and we were doing great. I mean, we were well-known in the West Country, we had day jobs, and we were playing at the weekends, earning good money, having a great time and there was absolutely no incentive whatsoever to leave that and come up to London until the 1st of January 1969 when I'd been up all night because uh, we'd, we'd done a gig down in Cornwall or Red, Red Ruth I think it was and we ended up going back to the DJ's place getting stoned I think Roger Taylor was there that night um, and 
I went into work uh, absolutely exhausted. I, I worked all day and it was when I'd finished doing all the deliveries that I was on my way back to timber yard. Um, I'd been delivering building materials uh, and I must have passed out on the seat uh, driving this the firm's vehicle and I hit a parked car. There was debris all over the road, buses and vehicles were having to drive on the pavement to get by. Um, I was bleeding profusely, shaking with a crowd of people gathered around me. Uh, I struggled to walk and the cops took one look at me and told the ambulance they could take me to hospital. I said to the, the guy who finished stitching me up, I said, well, can I go now? And he said, yeah. He said, you'll have to speak to the police. They'll be in the front outside. So I walked out, looked for these cops, nowhere. So I rushed off to the phone box and phoned up Steve. The first thing he said was, don't tell the cops that you were up all night. I staggered home and went to bed and slept for about 12 hours, I think. The tricky bit was, the really, really tricky bit, was that um, the cops informed me that if the parked car that I hit hadn't been there, I was headed straight for a woman with a small child in a buggy. That did my head in. I realised that the fact that I may have killed someone and had that on the conscience for the rest of my life, you know, uh, it was obvious to me that I had to make a choice between working in the daytime or working at night in a band. And I decided on the spot that I had to give it a try for at least a year to come up to London, which was the only place to be in this country, to try and see if we could get off the ground, you know? For several months, it was really, really difficult. And as a result of that, my, my brother decided to quit. He had a girlfriend in London, he got a job, and um, you know, he was doing great. Whereas Steve and I were like twiddling our thumbs thinking, what the bloody hell do we do now? So we had met Miles Copeland, who became our manager, and he really liked the band as it was, with a three piece, but when my brother quit, um, you know, we put an advert in Melody Maker um, and started auditioning guitar players, none of whom we were happy with, to replace my brother. We didn't feel any of them were up to it. What do we do? Uh, and in the end, they came up with the idea of, well, two guitar players, but they've got to be they've got to be able to play together. And then we went back through all the notes that we kept and dug out Andy Powell and Ted Turner, who we'd seen already and rejected, and we called them back. We did a second audition with them, and it was really obvious that it was going to work great, you know. Right. I've read you saying that um, in, in those early London days that you were uh, starving and stealing food. I've, I've read yeah. a story of you saying that you... Uh, you had an electricity meter and you were taking the money out of it and then at the end of the month <laughs> well, the landlady we, came to we, collect it we had we had our, our landlord and landlady they were they were irish they ran a um a working men's club she used to come in and i'm padlock the 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 bottom of the electricity meter to get the cash out so she padlocked it and everything but all you had to do was move it to the side and all the money fell out. So of course, because we were hard up, we were putting the money back in, um, I, intending to repay it later, if you know what I mean. Right, yeah, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> and, and when she suddenly arrived one day to get the money out, she was like, oh my God, I've been robbed. Uh, you know, and she was making her way out of the room very quickly. Well, oh, just a minute, no, no, no. Look, we, we borrowed a bit of money and we'll pay it back. And she went and called, she found out her old man, who was an absolute ox of a man. You know, one of these guys <laughs> whose, his head, which was glowing bright red permanently, I dread to think what his blood pressure was like. I mean, <laughs> and I figured that when he got back late that night, one o'clock in the morning-ish, he was gonna be really pissed off and come looking for yeah. us. So. I was actually asleep in bed with, with my girlfriend and I heard this really loud thumping and crashing on the door and I 
leapt out of bed, skinny little runt I was in them days, not being very well fed. Um, and I was kind of shaking, you know, but I thought, okay, if that bastard comes through the door, we've either got to leap out the window and do a runner, or I'll have to get a big knife and stab the bastard, you know, because he will kill us. <laughs> he will kill us, you know. And um, just then, as this was all going through my head, his wife and his daughter arrived. They'd come up from the basement and, and they were screaming at him and they both grabbed hold of him and dragged him away like a mad bull. And they all, they all went back down in the basement. I'd have managed to sleep there the night, but in the morning I'd already decided that night we were going to get the hell out yeah. of there. Bye! So, were you guys playing gigs at this point, or...? Not really, no. We got the band together, but we didn't really have any gigs yet, you know. In order to get gigs, you needed an agent, and we didn't have an agent. We did get one very soon after that, and Miles found him. He responded to an ad. The guy was trying to sell a book of contacts of, of promoters up and down the country and he wanted 20 quid for it or something. So Miles said to him, I will pay you 20 pounds once you've come over to my place and spent uh, a week booking my band a load of gigs. And when I see that you've done that, I'll buy the book off you. So that's what he did. He came over, he sat on the phone each and every day for a week. We had a, a, a shitload of gigs booked and then he got, Miles paid him and off he went. Oh, really? The, the gigs were bullshit. He, he just pretended to be speaking to people. <laughs> and Miles went round to his house, because well, he knew where he lived, and threatened to uh, to rearrange him, so to speak. Uh, and he broke down in tears and explained, you know, that he had no money and he was looking after his mother and all the rest of it. So, you know, it was a really sorry tale. But um, we managed, we did manage to find uh, some real... Uh, music biz folks that were capable of doing the job right very soon after that so then how did you come up with the name wishbone ash um the name of the band was very uh it did not fall into place easily at all um we had we a sheet of paper and we are writing suggestions for the band's name on that all of us there were all kinds of weird and wonderful names the only the only two i can remember were marty mortician and the coffinettes <laughs> which was very long and that that yeah. was that was ian copeland's suggestion um right. the middle brother of the copelands and miles's suggestion which he was absolutely over the moon about i thought it was the greatest name ever was jesus duck I was like <laughs> Miles. Jesus Duck. Fuck off. We're not going to be called Jesus Duck. <laughs> this was based on the fact that the two most famous people in the history of the world ever were Jesus Christ and Donald Duck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like calling yourself Marilyn Manson. You know, you've got yeah. Marilyn Monroe and Charlie Manson rolled into <laughs> one. So yeah. Jesus Duck. So he came bursting into the rehearsal room one day and he, he comes in and he says, Mark, listen, i got to have a name for this goddamn band. You know, I'm trying to do business for you guys on the phone and we still don't got a name. And I said, look, at Miles, we're trying to write fr frigging songs in here. So listen, here's the list. Okay. And I think I'd written the name Wishbone, which was the name of a character that I really liked in a Western film, you know, um, a guy with bandy legs, I think he had. So they called him Wishbone. So... I, I said wishbone, and I, I don't know if it was ash written on the page. I think it was cigarette ash on the page. And I said to him, I said, yeah, wishbone ash, that's the name of the band. So, okay, he walked out of the room, and everyone, Steve, Andy, Ted, said, uh, is that what the band's really going to be called? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about that. No, um, no, it, it's, that's a really strange name. I'm like, yeah. But listen, guys, okay, it's wish is for the future and ash 
is the remains of the past. You know, they both words contain S H, which is what people say when they hear noisy rock music. <laughs> <laughs> so, nice. so we've been trying to come up with a name of a, for the band for weeks and weeks, and none of you bastards have come up with a name. I have. <laughs> The name of the band is Wishbone Ash, and that's what it's going to be until somebody comes up with something better. So, you know, so Andy and Ted joined the band, and did you feel a sort of a, a creative uh, uh, link to them? Did you, did you think you could all sort of come up with music quite organically? Not really. I thought they were uh, a pair of freaks, you know. Um, Andy, <laughs> Andy Powell had... Um, suspect eyesight but we were very impressed with the fact that he had built his own guitar um i mean it did sound like shit but he was a copy of a gibson les paul and it was known as the les pal um he was he was a very unusual chap and indeed um at one point i i wasn't i, I thought that maybe he was the wrong man for the job Ted uh, was problematic as well. We we loved him as a bloke. He he had a, a, a lovely personality, but all all he knew on guitar was how to play a blues or a boogie woogie twelve bar, three chords, and he could play that in about three or four different keys. Um, so, I mean, he was he was an absolute beginner. Um, which is why we had rejected him when we auditioned him the first time round. I said about I said about teaching him everything I knew on guitar um, for the first few weeks that we got together, and he did an amazing job. He his memory was brilliant. He he learned everything I I taught him, and um, he just he just was like a sponge. He soaked it up. He really did. And he, 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 after a couple of weeks, he could play me everything I showed him. He could play it better than I could, you know. Um, right. So his attitude was brilliant. Yeah. Right. So in 1970, you ended up opening for Deep Purple. Um, how, yes. how did this happen? I don't know who got the gig. Um, probably our new agent, John Sherry. Um and we were supporting them at Dunstable Civic Hall. Uh, Richie, I noticed when we played, we, we only played for like half an hour or something, to begin it at the, to open the show. And um, Richie was on the side of the stage, which, you know, musicians do that. They'll, they'll check other bands out. Uh, usually it's for like five or 10 minutes with me it is anyway. Um, Richie was there for half an hour watching us play. I'm like, wow, he must like this band or something. And sure enough, I mean, I never spoke to him, um, but sure enough, about a week later, we got a phone call from Derek Lawrence, who had produced Deep Purple's um, hit single back in the 60s, Hush. Do you know that tune? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Derek uh, rang us up and said, listen, uh, Richie told me that you guys have got a really good band and um, I'm a producer and I would like to come along to one of your gigs and have a look at the band with a view to, to doing some stuff. And we're like, oh, okay. Uh, well, at the moment, we haven't got any gigs, but uh, you're welcome to come down to a rehearsal. So he came down to the rehearsal in, in, in Mars' basement um, I said, look, I love the band. I think the band is, is brilliant. Um, and I have a really good friend of mine has just been made head of A&R record, uh, A&R at, at MCA Records in Los Angeles. And if you guys pay for an airline ticket for me to fly out there, guarantee I'll bring you back a really good deal. And we're like, well, okay. How much is it going to cost to buy you a ticket to go to LA? And it was 300 quid return. I was like, ah, no way, no way. We, we, we can't afford that. We don't have that kind of money. So in the end, we agreed to pay half. 
and Derek picked up the tarp for the other half so it cost us £150 and we did write him in he came back with a brilliant deal and we wrote him in for to produce the first three albums that he did an excellent job on so uh, around that time what but when he was coming to see you, what 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 were you guys playing? We had you written songs, or were you doing covers, or? Yeah, we we were not interested in doing covers. We I'd done, I'd done that for six or seven years. My kind of apprenticeship in the sixties. We were into writing our own songs. Um, I mean, I I had written stuff before Wishbone uh, existed. Um, there were various ideas. Phoenix, we've been working on. Handy, um, various other tunes, Errors of My Way, I think. Uh, and even Blowing Free existed as an idea, you know. But right. it took a long time to put all these things together and get them recorded. We had recently, a few months before we arrived in London, played a gig with Led Zeppelin. Right. We were a support band uh, on their show when they played the annual Arts Ball in Exeter. What was that like? Um, the gig itself was ah oh, unbelievable. I mean, we opened the show, but there was a band on um, oh shit, what are they called? The Social Deviants. They were kind of like the Ramones in 1960 eight or nine you know they were way before their time really um scruffy bunch black leather and all that so somebody on the gig didn't like them and lobbed a pint beer mug at the stage which which didn't break mick farron the singer picked it up and threw it back into the audience <laughs> where it gashed it hit the floor oh, and then gashed a guy's leg right down by his ankle. It gashed it open. He had to be rushed to hospital and have it stitched up. This is a guy that we knew. I mean, he was a singer in a band himself. Right. Well, I was actually in the dressing room at the time. We were in there with Led Zepp. And all of a sudden, the deviants burst through the door, of the dressing room door, and ran into the dressing room followed by the audience <laughs> people just started <laughs> piling in there and eventually the bouncers arrived and kicked everyone out um and restored uh, order but they they did actually go out again and got in another fight you know with, with some people from the audience it was absolute craziness we uh when we went on stage already we we, we had a friend of ours and he he was a lighting man great looking guy very fit italianish black curly hair i mean beautiful looking dude um and i think because he realized it was a big gig led zeppelin there was a real buzz about them you know their the rec- the first album wasn't even released yet um he said i would really like to do something on that gig you know in one of your songs you know, like where you're freaking out and everything gets intense. I want to bring uh, Ruth, who was the girl that danced with Principal Edwards. I want to bring Ruth on in a bikini and I want to paint her. Right, paint her? What do you mean? It, well, you know, with a paintbrush, I'm just going to paint her as she dances in front of the audience. Right. <laughs> okay, yeah, sounds good, you know. So, so that's what we did on the night it, it, with this last tune that was, you know, pretty intense. He, he brings Ruth on and she's dancing away and he starts painting her with his paintbrush and a bucket of paint. Anyway, once he'd um, done a good bit of painting, he decides to pick up the can of paint, which was big, and tip it over the top of her head. <laughs> she was absolutely covered from head to foot in paint. And it went Incredible. everywhere. It was all over the stage. Made a right bloody mess. Um, when Led Zepp, <laughs> when Led Zepp came on, Robert Plant, uh, I think he was in quite high heel boots, and he was skidding all over the place. Um, <laughs> he was not amused with us. I mean, Led Zeppelin were mind-bogglingly good. I mean, they were just—you could see that you were watching 
a great band you know what i mean mm -hmm. the, the sound yeah. was incredible they were just like riveting to watch um but by the end of the evening you know we we got out of the back door thinking wow you know all that crap went on and we managed to escape unscathed until we saw our van which was parked at the back of the gig but now it was parked with a 4 by 12 and they had managed to wedge it under the back axle somehow so you couldn't drive the van anywhere it was like one of those what was the worst gig you ever played in some respects but uh, <laughs> in other respects it was like the best gig you ever played right okay i just want, I want to talk a, a little bit about some of the albums uh sure. from wishbone ash um so pilgrimage for me is sort of where the the sound sort of moves a little bit from what i would probably call hard rock towards yeah. a more progressive sound you know you've got songs like lullaby that sort of yeah. feel a bit like they wouldn't have really belonged on the first album I just sort of wondered how this happened. Did it sort of just evolve over time? Well, it was in those days. I mean, everything was happening at breakneck speed, you know, especially flying across the Atlantic. I mean, I'd never been out of the bloody country before, you know, mm -hmm. and, and all of a sudden we got, we got to start going and touring in America. And the, the first album was well received, you know, everywhere. And, and all of a sudden the record company screaming for a second album and we were like way way off of having another album ready to go but what we did have was the album cover which had been designed for the first album okay the pilgrimage cover had been designed for the first album and when when it got sent out to los angeles to the record company you know being american they took one look at it and like wait a minute what's this new band called wishbone ash uh and, and they send out this shit what is this a tree with a moon behind it um we need an album cover that says wishbone ash go find a wishbone and burn it you know and take a photograph so that's what they did now when we heard about that in england we thought Oh my God, the Americans, you know, they are so crass. They just got no imagination. You know, what are they like? Um, until they sent over a copy of what they'd prepared in, in their art room. And we took one look at it and everyone went, oh my God, you know, that looks amazing. It looks so unusual and different. You know, it looked great. Um, so, you know, we had to eat our words really because they did a fantastic job for, for the first album sleeve. So now, you know, we're, they're screaming for a second album and we've already got the cover. They haven't, you know. Right. <laughs> so we had to come up with the music now, you know. So we got in um, to Mars's basement again and literally scraped the bowl clean of every single idea that we had available. Um, the, the song alone got uh, edited down because it, dip, it tipped the balance into the album being too mellow. Right. So Derek, Derek our producer, decided, well, we'll just use the guitar bit and take the vocal out. And that's what happened to it. I think we were being very experimental at that point. We didn't have right. a really clear definition of what we were as a band you know were we a rock band were we a boogie woogie band were we a folk band or a jazz band? what were we you know and in the end we kind of liked the fact that we were experimental and that we dipped into different influences it made it very difficult to put a label on us um and we kind of quite liked that really uh, and we, we've, all we knew was we were a band that wanted to make good albums. Yeah. So I just want to briefly talk about Argus as well. This is sort of the sure. the, the big um, Wishbone Ash album, I think, the most popular and the most recognisable too. Well, I, as I already said, I mean, it, it was the th third album uh, mm -hmm. with the same team. That, that really yeah. helps, you know. It was, we were working together like a well-oiled machine. Was it just all coming naturally to you all? Well, um, I have had um, these ideas 
since the 60s really um you know big big issues big themes um time uh I, i've always had a strange relationship with time as you saw earlier this evening and um i was late being born and i've always been late ever since basically so it's a struggle but and i've, I've grappled with it time you know the time and space kaleidoscope uh, i've struggled with it and time is a constraint of the world in which we live really uh, if you're if you're somewhere different in space it's a different time you know you look at you look at other planets in the sky other uh, other galaxies and, and you're seeing light from three million years ago so what you're seeing is what happened millions of years ago how does that work I mean time is a relative concept and if if that's the case and it's it must always exist somewhere in space so it's it's an interesting thing to grapple with time was some time world got on to reincarnation that's what that's the theme that the lyric was trying to grapple with you know I mean I can't believe that I was thinking about those things back in the 60s but I was um, and uh, a lot of the other tunes you know like warrior was me being trying to figure out why it is that war has happened since the beginning of time and the only thing that i can be sure of is that it's always dictators despots warmongers managing to harness the energy of young men you know guys who want to fight for a cause they're full of piss and wind stroke passion and they sign up uh, and they fight having written that song um it's sounding good at the same time there's there's a noble quality you know about being a warrior you know such as in the olden days such as in japanese culture ninja warrior it's it's a special thing for a guy so once i'd finished the tune um i was a little bit a little bit afraid if you like that people would misinterpret what i was saying and think that i was like advocating war as you know this is cool this is the thing to do um so being a bloody libran i decided that i needed to balance it with another tune that should be a song of peace and as one song goes into the other i'm trying to create this imagery of like you know the end of a battle you know where you've got smoke in the air and dead bodies laying on the floor and carnage and destruction everywhere and then you go into this song of peace which was throw down the sword and that is is pretty much a hymn like when i was a kid and i sang in the church choir um ended up becoming head choir boy even so you know <laughs> uh, i've been soaking up religious music for years and also and singing and, and also listening to a hell of a lot of classical music we discovered that you know i could sing melody which i call pseudo classical melody all day long uh, because i'd listened to so much classical music and and that's what i used to do i mean you could sing it as a vocal you know and then work out the harmony i'd sing a harmony and it would sound good but if we transposed that onto the guitar it sounded really good that gave us what is now called a signature sound you know the minute you heard that that tune on the radio you knew who that band was it was wishbone ash because of the harmony guitars yeah yeah i didn't tell you about blowing free I, I'd had this idea way back in like 67 or 68 uh, about this Swedish girl I'd fallen in love with but I tried to convey to Andy and Ted um, how I wanted it to sound which was a boogie a 6-8 shuffle rhythm 
much like a song by Steve Miller. It's called Children of the Future. Right. The whole song came together pretty well, except we didn't seem to be able to get the energy to record it. We tried it once or maybe even twice before we got to the Argus album. I insisted on trying it again and we played it in the studio. You you can hear the bass on the recording is so damn pushy and is like screaming, you will work this time, you son of a bitch, you know. Um, and sure enough, I, I actually, when I came into the control room and listened to it, I thought, wow, these guys are finally injecting some bloody life into this thing and it's sounding good. Good, great. So the sickening thing was within a day, Derek Lawrence said, came up to me in the control room and said, Mark, listen, I've been talking to the guys uh, about this song of yours, Blowing Free, and basically everyone feels that um, it's, it's, it's kind of poppy and fluffy and all the other material is serious, you know, so maybe it belongs on a different album. I was gobsmacked I'm, and I said to him Derek no freaking way blowing free is going on this album okay end of conversation and the reason it's going on there is precisely because the album is so serious and it needs some light relief it needs a bit of balance or else it's too much of one thing you know and um, he could see that I was really intense about it and passionate about it and it wasn't worth getting in a fight about it. So he went away and, and discussed it with the lads and explained to them that Martin is adamant that it has to go on the album. I mean, can you imagine Argus without that chin? I, I was pretty peeved that the band would... I told them that I wanted songwriting credit for writing the whole bloody album. And they were not happy about that at all. They said that we had always credited all the songs to everyone, which we had pretty much done on the first album and Pilgrimage. Um, but I've, I felt that it was right that, you know, songwriters receive credit for what they do. But they mm -hmm. would not back down. And in the end, I had to either look at going and getting a lawyer and putting a stop on the album being released or go with it so you know i had to back down basically uh, okay. and i i didn't let i didn't let the principal go i mean i kept on banging away at it and eventually it was changed to reflect who had actually written the song not okay. all for one one for all um that's okay. okay for an album or two but not forever I mean, when, when, I, when I parted company with the band in 1980, it was announced that I had left the band, which was a lie. Um, uh, I was ousted from the band. Uh, in, in, it was very, I don't know, it was very sordid and dark and unfair. And it really bothered me. I, I was extremely angry about that for a very long time. Um, but eventually we got back together briefly in the late 80s and did three albums together. And then it was, I think I appeared with Andy a few times during the 90s just to help him out on various tours and all the rest of it. Um, and it wasn't until 2004 Five, I think, before I decided that um, I I had been to some of his shows, and um, I used to go along now and again, and you know it was it was nice to kind of hear the songs being played, but I you know it was not. A good representation of, of Wishbone Ash and its music. I mean, how can you sing lyrics that you haven't written and, and uh, they're about your life and how can you sing them with any meaning when you don't understand what they're saying? Do you know what I 
I mean, right. so yeah. I, I mean, it, it was. I, I want to say it was crap, you know, but it, it was, it was sad that people were going along to gigs because they like Wishbone Ash and they were hearing Andy Powell's band um, and clapping politely, but there was no. There was no feeling. There was no passion in it. There was. It was just, um, you know, a representation of something that had gone before, and and really it could not be, have been further away. And I decided that I would really, really like people to hear Wishbone Ash's music that contained the spirit that it was played with originally. You know. Right. So now with with these guys here, so we got Misha and Tim uh, and Danny. Um, how do they compare to the original Wishbone Ash for you? Does it feel Careful like the same energy? <laughs> yes, there's there's there there is um, a similarity to get there. Yeah, I mean Misha and Danny are different as guitar players, but that's what you need. You need different flavors you know this guy's good at this this guy's good at that they it, it, they're just different um and that's exactly how the original wishbone ash was um tim also does bear a, a slight resemblance to steve in, in, in his quirkiness and his unusualness and his his intensity <laughs> um it's, it's very similar similar feel to steve and for and for you guys, what is it like, you know, playing with someone like Martin? <laughs> <laughs> they're all they're all rushing. To, they're all rushing to tell you about his eyebrows. <laughs> That's what we do mainly. We have to avoid the eyebrow because if we if we get the eyebrow, then we know that we've stepped out of line <laughs> and po- possibly played too played too many notes. Uh, you know, you get the eyebrows giving it that. And Martin is very abundant of eyebrow. I'm not even. I'm not even aware. I'm not even aware that that I do this. But during this whole pandemic, you guys were on a big tour, right? Yeah, we got four dates. Four dates done of twenty-four, I thought, twenty-three dates or something like that. And we literally got one weekend out the way, and then that was it. The the shutters came down. All the rest, all the rest got postponed. Yeah. On the last one of the four, we were we had to sort of keep away from the audience, not do the meet and greet. That was yeah. the policy. Uh, but little did we know that that was going to be the last gig for well, who knows till who knows when really. So, have you guys written any music together as a band? Yeah, we're writing most of the time. Yeah, um, all sorts of stuff really, not just wishbone type material, but pop and everything really um not that uh there's much of it out there but um yeah it's i think that's one of the things that's been keeping us sane is the fact that we've had recording projects and bits and pieces to do over this lockdown period you know as with different members and with different other people as well which is kind of allowed to keep going while the while the bands had to go on hiatus really you know it's 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 really really good for us you know me and Misha are in the studio today we spent the stu- spent the day together in the studio working on tracks for bits and pieces and it's it's great you know that keeps us sane keeps us you know keeps our musical brains working well, right so yeah so I, I just sort of wanted to ask you three um outside of Martin were you all Wishbone fa- uh Wishbone fans growing up yeah I was yeah but when I was at uh when I was at school, about 15 years old, I'm 10 years younger than Martin, but when I was at school, about 15, a mate of mine who was the kind of um, guru of uh, musical knowledge, he said to me, you, you've got to listen to this band, this album by a band called Wishbone Ash Argus. Uh, so anyway, I, I, I got my mum to buy it when she went into town and uh, stuck it on the record player and wow the intro to time was just i knew straight away that this this is this is just the sort of thing that i'm i'm always going to want to listen to and want to play like what about you tim what was your introduction to wishbone ash i kind of got into the people who were influenced by 
Wishbone Ash. So I I got into Iron Maiden when I was very young, and uh, and they always mentioned you know Steve Harris was a massive Iron Maiden, uh, massive Wishbone Ash fan, and always mentioned Argus. So that's how I found out about Wishbone Ash. So. Um, so my kind of introduction was the Argus album and, and listening to that. And uh, I could definitely hear where, especially on the first Iron Maiden album, how they had stolen a lot of the the vibe in stuff like Remember Tomorrow and stuff like that. Um, the kind of the Argus, the twin guitar thing and the melodic ideas and the mixture of the kind of the folky, jazzy side of things, the psychedelia mixed with the kind of the heaviness of King Will Come or whatever. So... That would be my introduction, I suppose. What about you, Misha? Uh, well, my introduction to Wishbone Nash, 1980. It's, I got my uh, first guitar. I was born in 1969, so in 1980 it was kind of the end of the band, really. But So I kind of uh, remember as a little kid watching uh, the Flying V on TV. That, that was my I- image that stuck in my mind, that Flying V guitar. But 1981, a friend of uh, mine, uh, uh, um, uh, her dad uh, was was a true Fishbone Ash uh, uh, fan, and he had all the records, uh, and he had a really good, expensive record uh, player in a room set up for listening. So uh, I remember 1980, end of 1980, beginning of 81, I uh, uh, listened to a couple of albums with a couple of uh, uh, other. Uh, boys from school in 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 this uh, room, uh, uh, y- y- you know, with and they would put the record on, the Argus or Pilgrimage, and and uh, uh, and we would just listen uh, to it uh, like for like forty five minutes or whatever, however long the album was, without saying a word, you know, and uh, uh, yeah, so that that was my introduction. So yeah, I just want to ask all of you individually, really what your own sort of uh, career highlight of being in in Martin's Wishbone Ash? I basically moved from London in 2013 and I think I got in touch with Tim, who I used to study a long time uh, ago back in London. He came to do a session and then when we showed up at the door, we suddenly go, God, I haven't seen you for 25 years. Anyway, so he basically... Uh, told me that Martin was looking for a guitar player when in 2015 so uh, should we just say that we uh, I've I've kind of shown for one audition and then Martin asked me to kind of do, do another come one more time and do do another another one and I did another second audition and then uh, Danny told me hey, Misha just to let you know this is uh, this is the second audition you failed <laughs> <laughs> And, and he did. Yeah, and I did. Right. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh, I think on that v- uh, first kind of like obviously playing with Martin, we just kind of obviously now feel like it's it's like a family. I mean, the band. Every, we just really get along so well uh, as a band. I think. Um, I don't know. It was like I showed up and I played the the Pilgrim for the very first time. Not that I was extremely prepared for it, but anyway, I I did kind of play a some kind of solo, and then uh, uh, when we finished, Martin said to me. Uh, 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 you know, Andy Powell could uh, could never really kind of play in seven. In seven. So I suppose that was a compliment. You know, <laughs> that means like I, I could. Well, I was yeah. gonna say, so, I'm uh, sure Andy failed his first audition, right? So I guess right, you're yeah, equal, he did, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I failed too. So <laughs> <laughs> That's a good sign. You know, I think the one we was it was it the one we played under the bridge was recently yeah, was a was really great, really great, good yeah. gig great gig yeah uh, and also playing i think we, we we did a gig in greece in um uh you know nothing's the very the very first time we went there it's uh it's like a really great atmosphere yeah that, that's sort of like uh so those i mean there's obviously little gigs as well uh but those kind of maybe you know i i i uh what's the el pie club as well is it the el pie club the el pie in, club yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i think on those the gigs where you can feel the love uh, from from the audience, mm-hmm. you know, like you kind of feel you're performing to a bunch of people that uh, that sort of like know the material so well, you know, like super fans, uh, and you know when you see the smiles on their faces, then you are, uh, yeah, it just feels so good. Mm. So yeah, I think uh, Tim. Uh, well, yeah, I've got so many really. I've done. This is probably the longest I think I've been, you know, 
a member of a band, so it's kind of going back for so long now. Uh, but um, Japan was amazing. We did. We went over. We flew over to Japan to do two shows in Tokyo, um, probably three or four years back now, and that was just amazing. Just give me a stage, give me a drum kit. I'm a happy boy, and you know I've been a very happy boy over the years playing with this band because I get to play with my best mates. So I'm I'm happy. I'm a very happy, very happy man. It's been a, a great experience, and long may it continue when they allow us to. Mr. Wilson, found, well, hundreds of gigs that are big and small, and the people that you meet, and the the way they analyse every. Uh, chord every solo it puts you under a certain amount of pressure but I think that's a good thing um, it does does make you just uh, you know drag a few more percent out of your performance we've been to some fantastic places you know Greece uh, Tokyo Mexico the States as well and that's what makes it so hard this is the first year I don't think we've traveled you know <laughs> first, first year I haven't no. been outside the country it's like ah. um, and also the food in Germany is another thing as well. <laughs> food in the dressing rooms in Germany. <laughs> and the that beer. an honorary mention for that as <laughs> yeah. well. Yeah. Um, the Joe Walsh came out on the road with us with Barnstorm, got put on the show. Um, he, was, he started out opening the gig, then he got bumped up after uh, Renaissance, then he got bumped up after Vinegar Joe, and if the tour had gone on any longer, we would have been supporting him because Rocky Mountain Way ended up going to number one. Um, I arrived at the gig one night with the guys who were in the limousine and it, had, it was being played on the radio. It had just that day gone to number one and it was on the radio as we got out to walk into the gig. We go into the gig and he's playing it live on stage. I mean, just fantastic. Electric in the air. Brilliant. Wonderful stuff. Right. Right, well, I, I, I can see that time is pushing on a little bit, so I'm going to let you guys go. But I just wanted to say uh, thank you all so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you very much, no Rhys. Nice to, uh, nice to meet you, mate. Yeah, lovely. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Communication Breakdown. I want to say a big thanks to my special guest, uh, Martin Turner at X Wishbone Ash. Uh, and I want to say a big thanks to my camera assistant, Benjamin Freely. Join us next week where we will be interviewing Curved Air. Thank you so much for listening, and hopefully, we'll see you next week. Bye.